It's nice to see you all, and a happy Sunday to you. Let's pray. Father, on this day you overcame sin and the grave, and you promised to lead us to everlasting life through your Son, Jesus Christ. Give us that hope and courage as we face the week ahead in the sure and certain hope of the resurrection to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. A very happy Sunday to you. Today, this, uh, you've, you have come to... Uh, I always find it's nice to tell people where they are. And... Uh, <laughs> And, and that's because I've literally been on, in situations, you know, at the gate or somewhere in the airport, and they say, now boarding for Austin, Texas. And I'm going, well, I'm going to Chicago. And, you know, they've done a gate change or something, so it's nice. And St. Paul is so nice in the scriptures. He tells you right up front, I, Paul. Uh, you don't, you know, in, in the 21st century, we end a letter. So sometimes you actually have to read to the end of it to find out who sent the letter. Um, they, they had it a little wiser then, you know, right up front. Paul, Paul sending this. This is great. Today, you found yourself in a series called Images of Heaven, which when I was assigned this assignment, um, and I was being just a good boy, and I said yes, I thought perhaps another, another way would be, how do I get to heaven? <laughs> Uh, that was sort of how this country boy started this exploration. Heaven is one thing, but how do I get there? Or that great Loretta Lynn, isn't it? Everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. Um, that's a fantastic hit. So how do I get to heaven? How do we get to heaven? This is not a trick question. Uh, the way we get to heaven, uh, also the way every, almost every prayer ends in the prayer book, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Uh, today, I was assigned to look at a little bit about those images of what it might be like, what, what the experience may be like. Uh, the first full disclosure is I've never been to heaven. Uh, I'd like you to know that. I think I've come close to hell several, uh, several times and uh, even a few family reunions that sort of worked out like that, but I've never been to heaven. So what I share with you is the hope of heaven uh, rooted in the Holy Scriptures and the great capital T tradition of the church. Uh, that's what I share with you now. Specifically rooted, Father David asked me when he built this series, uh, he assigned me the book of the prophet Joel, in particular chapter 3, verses 17 through 21. And I will tell you that I did not know off the top of my head what Joel 3, 17 through 21 says. Do any of you? Okay, um, I, I'm glad. Because then I tell you what happened this morning as I was thinking about this, uh, last minute is my speciality. So I came and I said, well, I probably should look up actually what Joel says <laughs> before I pontificate on Joel. And this morning, I tell you, I hope you find this encouraging and not merely coincidental. This is the Bible that's by my desk. I picked it up, stuck my thumb in the side with no plan, rhyme, or reason, and it opened to Joel 3. I'm not kidding. Now, you may, um, the great words of the wonderful 20th century Archbishop of Canterbury, um, William Temple, whose um, archbishop prick was cut short. Archiepiscopacy was very brief, but it was very profound. He said once, uh, somebody made fun of him for praying before events and things in his life, and it was a non-believer, and he just simply said to him, well, you might want to look at this way. When I pray, coincidences happen, and when I don't, they don't. I always liked that little jingle. So I opened to Joel 3. Now, the section I was assigned. Joel's a very short book, by the way. I read the whole thing this morning at 5.30. And it's only three chapters and can be read in under 10 minutes. And it's probably the first time I've read the whole book in 20 years. 
and I went straight to my assigned part, and then I went back and reread the whole thing. But Joel 3, 17 through 21 uh, says this, as we think about images of heaven. So you shall know that I am the Lord your God, who dwell in Zion, my holy mountain, and Jerusalem shall be holy, and strangers will never again pass through it. And in that day, that great day of the Lord, of which Joel writes, the mountains shall drip with sweet wine, and the hills shall flow with milk. I think heavy cream would have been better. And all the stream beds of Judah shall flow with water. And a fountain shall come forth from the house of the Lord and water the valley of Shittim. And that is the name of the valley. And the book, um, it, well, in this section of Joel, what we see happening is this outpouring of God's own Spirit upon those who believe on what Joel keeps referring to as the day of the Lord. That great day, uh, or as Joel himself calls it, that great and terrible day. Great for some, terrible for others. That great day that God comes, or even better, God takes us home. So here's the heaven bit. That day will be a time when God will judge the earth, and He will bring His people home. And as I said, a day of dread for many, but a day of rejoicing for those who trust in God, in Jesus, in that sure and certain hope of resurrection to everlasting life. And we will rejoice on that day. Um, we pray, Thy kingdom come, as the title of this series. And we will go to be with Him and have everlasting life. Just a few paragraphs before thinking about the day of the Lord, Joel said, Be glad, rejoice in the Lord your God, for He has given you the autumn rains because He's faithful. He sends you abundant showers, both autumn and spring rains, as before. The threshing floors will be filled with grain. The vats will overflow with new wine and oil. I will repay you for the years the locusts have eaten my great army that I sent among you. You'll have plenty to eat until you're full. It's like Thanksgiving. And you will praise the name of the Lord your God who's worked many wonders for you. Never again, and this is I think where I want to hone in, never again will my people be shamed. And then you will know that I am the Lord your God and there is no other. Never again, Joel writes, prophesying at the mouthpiece of God, will my people be shamed. Now, let me give you a little background, just a quick background on Joel, um, or Joel if you prefer. And it, we know, it won't take long because we know about this much about it. Um, we only know really that it's written by one named Joel. We don't know when. And the only reason we know it's written by Joel is because the very beginning of the book um, again, in that they were, they were bright. The word of the Lord that came to Joel. So we, that's all we know. And we know that in the first section of this three chapter little very brief prophecy, we know that we, have, um, we find Israel in a time where locusts have devastated the grains, the vineyards, the orchards. And instead of any sort of Prayer or um, return to the Lord, as Joel says specifically. You know, we read from Joel on Ash Wednesday. And St. Peter quotes from Joel on the day of Pentecost. It plays a pretty big role. So Father David's a sharp cat. He gave me something uh, that I can work with here. And, and <clears throat> this, instead of a return to the Lord in thought or word or deed, the people prefer to ignore the times. And... Uh, does that sound in any way contemporary? Uh, my, my wife, Malacy, listens in, in her car. She travels for work, but uh, mostly in the air. But if she's in the car, she's got XM radio. And um, that, that is one thing I love. I, I, don't think, I don't think it's that much. It may be, what, 20 bucks a month or something? But it, if it's indulgent, I don't care. It's so wonderful. I've got every song and news program at my fingertips. And she goes between um, the Billy Graham Network and Catholic Radio. 
So she really gets the best of both worlds. Um, sometimes people will say, well, how would you describe your churchmanship? And I would say, well, I'm, I'm an evangelical Catholic. And they're like, huh? And I said, yes, in the, in, in the sense of the best of both of those words. And she said, Billy Graham had a wonderful thing he was describing. He said, um, and this is to my point of going on about business as usual, even though the locusts have eaten the crops. Uh, he said, Billy said in, in an interview once, have you, have you noticed all these world leaders get together for these huge forums? You know, they all fly in and they go and study some world problem and they all come out and you know you've never heard one of them step out and say, well, we've discovered the root of our problem and it's human sin and our inability to have relationship with God and one another. You never have, you, you have never heard that. Um, and so this is, this is nothing new. This was going on at the time. Locusts have destroyed everything and there's not nary a person that says, maybe we ought to return to the Lord. Maybe we ought to pray. Maybe we should consider things differently. So that's the first section of Joel is this um, horrible situation that uh, they need rain. And the crops have been eaten and have dried up. And then the second part of it is really chapter 3. And it's, it's the prophecy of hope that God ultimately will intervene into the situation and bring hope, and bring restoration, and then he gives us this, this heavenly vision. And with this wonderful imagery that it will come to pass, that mountains shall drip with new wine. Oh, I've never seen a wine-covered mountain. <laughs> but perhaps you can sense I might like to. and the hills flowing with milk. And the brooks of Judah shall be flooded with water. It's a very dry place, and all of a sudden water will even show up in a dry place. And a fountain will begin to flow. And the f water, and then there will be water in the valley of Shittim. And this is where I really just probably want to end about, for about five minutes. That valley doesn't really mean two diddlums to you and to me. But it would mean a whole heck of a lot if you lived in the 6th century BCE. Do you remember what happened in that valley in other parts of the Bible? You know, and keep in mind where the prophecy says my people will never be face shame again. They'll never be ashamed again. That doesn't mean just what the invaders did to his people. That's their own behavior. That he's going to cover over the very worst bits of their history. Do you know what happened in that valley? and what will be swallowed up in God's final victory in those lasting days of abundance when those things will, be, will fade away and will be less than even a distant memory. In the valley of Shittim is a place that was so associated with the greatest failure and the greatest embarrassments. Also is a place associated with triumph because that's where they camped out before Joshua led them into the promised land. But it's, it's also a place of great failure and shame and embarrassment. It's on the eastern side of the Jordan River, Jordan River, just north of the Dead Sea, right around Jericho. Some of you have been there. It was where the king of Moab sent his young women of Israel to seduce all the Israelites into sexual immorality. And that was in, and you can read about that in Numbers 25. It's the only interesting part of the book of Numbers. Um, it's, it's the only place. And it was also, um, it is also in that valley in which Sodom and Gomorrah resided in that valley. You remember that place? Not exactly associated with virtue and all that's good and right and true and holy. It's like Bourbon Street on steroids. <laughs> and God brought judgment there because of their sins. And that place is a place that... Um, is nothing but desolate, even to this day. It, it's so dry there. I remember being there. I think I used an entire tube of chapstick from just one end of the Dead Sea to the other. And it's only about three hours. That's how dry it is. And it's a place associated with great shame. Um, when, when, when the 
soldiers um, fornicated with these, these loose women um, and then faced that their whole life. And so when, when the hearer would hear this, um, God's smart. He knows the thoughts and actions of, our, of, of the heart, right? We look at the outside, but God looks at the inside. And he knows that's a place of great shame and sadness for the Israelites. And he says, I'm going to take that very, very worst memory you have, and that one in particular, I'm going to cover over with a fountain. You think it's a dry, terrible place that you can't face? I can transform even that into something verdant. That's a great English word, isn't it? Very green and rolling hills. And with, with this place that has no water, uh, that I'm going to just fill it. I'm going to wink an eye and Lake Mead will overflow and all of a sudden Los Angeles County will have water. Uh, uh, to put it in a, in a West Coast parable. God is going to cover over thy kingdom come. God is going to cover over your very worst things and my very worst things. These are healing waters that He will bring and cover over us with the righteousness of His Son, Jesus Christ. And as I say, the absolute worst places. Let me just ask you, um, and this is it for maybe four minutes now. I said that eight minutes ago. The, can you go back to the very most um, shameful place in your life? It probably doesn't, as I, I'm asking myself the same question. As I do that, it doesn't take me long, and I have more than one. <laughs> so when I, as I say, go to the most shameful, uh, I've got so many now that I'm, I'm, I'm rolling down the list, so I'll just stop at four uh, as I ask you the, the very same question. And um, I want you to know that it will be covered by him. And so that leads me to just ask, so what? So what? what how might this change my life? How might this change your life this week? And I can tell you that it would be through a great sense of unburdening that you might experience. And do you remember, I think I'll tell it to you through what is one of the greatest little pieces of 20th century American literature that is, is really overlooked. And it's, it's so good, you should read it this afternoon. It's called, it's a poem. And it's, no, it's a short story. It's not a poem strictly, it's a short story by Langston Hughes, um, middle 20th century African-American writer, and it's called Thank You, Ma'am. And I got to thinking about it this week because Paddington Bear said of the Queen, Thank You, Ma'am. But when I heard the words Thank You, Ma'am, I actually went to this obscure, relatively obscure 20th century poem because that's just how it works when you're slightly insane. And I, I um, remembered that Langston was a busboy, <coughs> first, if, if you know a little bit about him, and he would write short stories and things and hand it to the staff in the restaurants. And finally, one day, this, this girl said, you really should be a writer. And he went, I don't, I don't think I'm that good of a writer. But he quit being a busboy and, of course, a very fam was a very famous writer. In the poem, have you ever read Thank You, Ma'am? Does anybody know which one I'm talking about? So you do. Okay. It's, it's so profound. It's, it made me think this morning. I said... Thank you, ma'am, is the Joel 317 of middle 20th century American short story. Because in Thank You, Man, Ma'am, there are only two characters. Thank You, Ma'am, by the way, is a thousand words. So you can read that and Joel this afternoon. And you can do that faster than you can read the op-eds in the Wall Street Journal. It's the story between just two characters, and I believe his, I printed it here, but I believe out of memory, yes, his name was Roger. Roger is a young boy, 14 to 15-ish, a boy who's gotten into mischief and is um, kind of living on the streets. Uh, we're not told why, really doesn't matter. But he in encounters this woman one night, and she's described as a large woman with a large purse that had everything in it but hammer and nails. It had a long strap, and she carried it slung across her shoulder. It was about 11 o'clock at night and she was walking alone. And the boy came up behind her and tried to snatch her purse. And the strap broke, but only one strap breaks. And instead of absconding with the purse, she grabs him by the proverbial back of the neck. And they happen to be right by her house. 
and she drags Roger inside. Okay, and you can imagine young 14-year-old Roger like, what in the heck has just happened? I was trying to steal a purse. And um, eventually we learn, I'm trying to find where we learn her name because the names are Luella Bates Washington Jones. Uh, Put yourself in contact with me, said the woman. If you think that contact is not going to last a while, you've got another thing coming. And it said, then she says to him, when I get through with you, sir, you're going to remember Mrs. Luella Bates Washington Jones. And so we expect Luella Bates Washington to bring the hammer. Do you know what she does? She leaves the purse on the table. She goes. He said he needed to steal the money to buy some shoes. Likely story. And uh, she cooks him supper, cleans his face up, feeds him a meal, then serves up a dessert that happened to be his favorite. And then she reaches in her purse and hands him the $20 he said he was going to steal and says, go and get the shoes that you wanted. She puts him out on the step, and as he, Roger says, in the very end of the, of the short story, after all this has transpired, it, it, the narrator tells us the boy wanted to say something else other than thank you, ma'am, to Mrs. Lou Bates Washington Jones, but he couldn't do so. As he turned and looked back, he barely managed to say thank you, and he never saw her again. Now, can you see the Lord of all creation who's promised to bring the kingdom to us? Can you just say thank you, sir? And can you see what a cleanup job through Jesus that he has, is doing in our lives? And we're so afraid that he's going to bring the hammer, and he brings supper, and he brings dessert and he brings healing waters that are covering, completely covering of our sin and shame. And I saw that in the story of Joel, and I see it in that Thank You, Ma'am by Langston Hughes. I told Father David this earlier today, and I want to say it in light of what he assigned me. This great experiment of faith is meant to unburden us to lift that burden that clings to us, whether it's shame or sadness, whatever you want to call it. I saw on the BBC this morning a very moving interview with John Sentamu, and John Sentamu is the former Archbishop of York. He retired in 2018. And if you're an Archbishop of York or Canterbury, you have to get the Queen's permission to retire. And he went to see her in 2018, he said, and he said, I went with a with the heaviest burden of my life. And then he said, perhaps one day it will come out. He said, that's not what this interview is about. But I went with the heaviest burden I've ever felt. And John Sentamu has felt burdens. He was a, he's a Ugandan-born Christian who was persecuted under Idi Amin. So the man knows burdens. So for him to say this was the heaviest when he lost his parents under Idi Amin. So he's going and he meets with the queen to ask for retirement. And after he asks and she grants it, um, she asks, is there anything else I can do for you? And Archbishop John said, he asked, uh, would you pray for me? Would you keep me in your prayers? And she said, I'll pray for you right now. And she said, would you close your eyes and put your hands together? And he said, I did so. And as I put my hands together and closed my eyes, I felt her warm hands come over my hands. And he said, she prayed in the spirit, he says, for three minutes. And he doesn't remember the content of the prayer. He just remembers the words, Amen. And he said, as soon as she said, Amen, my burden had been lifted. My hope and prayer for you, as you think about the kingdom coming, the coming of the kingdom, the king who will, in the most shameful part of your life and in mine, bring forth a spring of healing water. As you think about that today and this week, that you and I might be unburdened, unburdened for new life and ministry. Uh, and that's all I wanted to say today. So that's enough, really. And we can, <laughs> we've talked about all sorts of things. So let's uh, thank, thank you. Let, let's, um, let's just uh, say, we say it a lot in the liturgy, but let's say in our Father uh, together. So now we're bold to say the words our Savior Christ hath taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen.